I'm sure we've all had personal enemies, adversaries, nemesis, nemesi. You know, that person that you initially have conflict with, and then it spirals into tension, into where it almost seems as if that person has been put on the planet for the sole purpose of stopping you from doing your thing. Now, I'm not talking about bullies, about sexists, racists, homophobes, transphobes. That's at least a full TED Talk. I'm talking about that person that you just have one-on-one -on -one conflict with. In my life, the most obvious example of this was my freshman year algebra instructor, Mr. Rodebeck. That's not his real name. Not because I'm protecting his identity, but because I am went to high school before the internet years old. Mr. Rodebeck hated me to the point in which I was assured that he stayed up every night sitting on an old couch eating stale chips that he dug out between couch cushions, plotting my demise. So I rebelled against him by rolling my eyes through all of his lectures and not doing my homework. Because that's how you really send a message to your teacher, right? <laughs> I'm going to sabotage my own grade, man. <laughs> and Mr. Rudderbach also would get infuriated if you were late to his class. And our school did this thing where they played the same song for every class period. So you knew when you had to hustle the class based on where the song was at. Now, if I was even 20 seconds early to his class, I would wait outside in the hallway and then finally crossed the threshold right as the song was finishing. Did I mention I was really petty? Yeah. Years later, I ran into Mr. Rudderback at a Polish buffet, the Red Apple in Chicago. I only say the name in hopes they'll sponsor me. And when I saw him, I was finishing up graduate school, and I called out his name, and he turned around and he said, how'd you like them straight Ds I gave you in algebra, Shamara? <laughs> He didn't say that. Instead, he just stared at me. And I could tell that he was putting together that I must have been an old student of his, so I reintroduced myself. Now, either Mr. Rodebeck was one of the great actors of our time, or he truly didn't recognize me. Which is bizarro. You would think that if I was his arch nemesis for a whole year of his life, He'd remember that guy, but it dawned on me. I was just another student in his class way back when. As I sat back down, eating a delicious pierogi, I began a process and exercise that has served me well ever since. I wrote my adversary's backstory, but this time with compassion. I remember that Mr. Rodebeck told us that his favorite teaching memory was when he was a math instructor in college because he worked with upper division students who had a passion for his subject. I then thought of what it must have been like for him to teach me and fellow students who would sigh with disgust every time he lectured about Pythagoras and their magical triangles. I then likened him to some of my favorite professors like one who was older around his age who also was frustrated if you were late to her class and explained that it shows consideration for others to be on time. Mr. Rodebeck shared that value. It dawned on me that I was writing Mr. Rodebeck as a lazy, one-dimensional character in the story where I was the plucky hero and he was the mean, burnt-out math mortician. Now, at that time, I was also beginning to teach as part of my assistantship and struggled with some students that I was having conflict with was similarly labeling them as one-dimensional characters. Have you ever watched high school movies where teen characters are drawn really poorly? Like, I remember being 16, watching a teen in a movie sometimes whose whole character was basically snarky, snarky, snark, slouch. Jeez, Mom, ugh! Stomp, 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 stomp. I would watch this and think, there's no way in the world that whoever wrote this has ever met actual teenage humans. Yet that was the kind of character that I was writing about my adversaries. Hell, I was turning people into adversaries. I sat in the Red Apple for hours, in part because it's all you can eat. Ding. 
And I started to write full, thoughtful backstories about Mr. R and the students I was having conflict with. I started to liken those college students to friends that I knew when I was growing up who were either introverted, gave off bad first impressions, like my buddy Beale, who my neighbor was convinced was a bully, is still my most loyal friend to this day. I also started to consider how many times we've had best friends, and I'm sure this has happened to you, who you disliked when you first met. Like for me, it was my little brother. Like he just kept screaming when I met him. He was an infant, so it made sense. But nevertheless, we thankfully moved past those first impressions, and we began to understand their stories and embrace them. Now there's a second part to this exercise, and that is to write your backstory honestly through your adversary's eyes. Based only off of your interaction with them, what do they know about you? Have you shown them your best character traits for them to draw a favorable backstory? Like, Mr. Rudderback didn't know that I was an empathic friend, that I had gone to a math tutoring center throughout junior high and was just really insecure. Well, I'm sure he could tell I was really insecure, that was obvious, but otherwise he didn't know this stuff. I know that there are times in which we run into people in our lives that we just disconnect with. But ever since that moment in the Red Apple, I've made it a habit to write their backstories, to try to understand how they see the world differently than me, how they're interpreting me based off of the impressions that I'm giving. I try to write them as heroes in their stories. Now, I'm sure I don't get this right every time I do the exercise, but it has especially led to me connecting with students who I can tell feel as if they're unseen. Students who are experiencing trauma and anxiety and challenges and seem shocked when I believe them. Now, if you lead with your heart, write a compassionate backstory, and you're still met with disdain, at that point, you're probably dealing with someone who is abusive, racist, sexist, or bigoted, and continuing to interact with them is an emotional toll that no one deserves. But in the case of just having conflict with someone one-on-one, -on -one, so much can be gained through this exercise. Many of us will never know what it's like to be celebrated as a hero. But when you personally treat someone this way, it makes a difference. I know this because I've met people when I was frail and at my worst, who I could tell were trying to picture me at my best. Something that I've picked up from my wife over the years and the way that she treats people is in realizing that some folks will sit at arm's length, who need to be pulled in whose faces we should cheer into for their accomplishments, who deserve to know what it's like to be understood and then celebrated, to be hoisted up on someone's shoulders heroically and carried off of a field under a downpour of champagne and ticker tape, even if it's just through one person at a time.